Now with lecture seven, uh, we've arrived at last at a period from which we have landscape paintings preserved that are reliably by great recorded artists. Uh, two of them, which I'll show in this first part, 7A, even signed by those artists. So I can begin to speak now uh, as I couldn't before, speak more securely about the styles of the artists and whether a certain work is by him or close to him or by a follower. And I can speak about how the followers continued some features of the of the master's style while not continuing or losing others. Northern Sung Monumental Landscape stands in my estimation as a high point in the whole history of Chinese painting. And more than that, is up there with mm, Gothic cathedrals and the music of Bach, what you will, as among the great works of man. Um, whether I can convince you of that in these lectures is another problem. Uh, the paintings are not showy, and some people, lots of people, find them at first rather plain. Um, I've had, I, throughout my career, I've had people ask, why is this landscape by Fan Quan such a, such a great work? And I haven't found it easy to answer. Um, but I will attempt in this, in this lecture now to start you at least on the way to some understanding of and appreciation of these works, which I take to be, as I say, a real, a real high point of the whole of Chinese painting. Let me say a bit on history before we continue into the landscape of the Song Dynasty. China is unified again under the Song from 960 on. In the north, the Liao continued to hold power, holding a large area of present-day China in the north and northeast. <clears throat> the Chinese fear them. They pay tribute in order to be left in peace. Uh, and there is peace between the Liao and the Song for, the, for that time. Apart from that, the Song is fairly strong in the first half of the dynasty, which we call the Northern Song, 960 to 1027. Northern Song and Southern Song are designations of period, that is, not a region. Uh, in the Northern Song, the, there were, the emperors were strong, the administration was generally effective. But toward the end of the period, uh, political factions were in bitter strife and the monarchy was weakened. Also, another nomadic people appear in this late, at the end of this period. They are the Jurchan Tartars, or Jin Tartars. And in the early 12th century, they capture the Chinese capital in the north, Kaifeng. They drive the Liao art, replace them, and capture the northern capital, forcing the Chinese to move to the south. And the Chinese eventually reestablish their capital down in Hangzhou. And after that, what follows is called the Southern Song period. So, as I say, these are designations of period, not a region. <clears throat> Crucial to the strength of the administration in the, North, in the administration in the Northern Song was the development of a civil service. This is extremely important. The system by which men achieved office, rose to office, official rank, through exams, examinations based on the Confucian classics, not on their effectiveness as administrators, but on Confucian classics. This is sometimes likened to the British system of, um, of men of some rank with a certain kind of school background in which they learn the Greek and Roman classics, and then they go on to become officials and so on. So they all had something they could talk about when they weren't uh, administering, whatever. Uh, at any rate, this is when... This is the time when this ideal type of scholar official, a cultivated man who was eligible for office, even though he might be out of office for political reasons or living in retirement or whatever, um, uh, was established uh, at this time, this ideal type. It's important for the beginnings of Wen Renhua, or what comes to be called Wen Renhua, a scholar amateur painting, that is. Later in the Northern Song, um, the conflict was aroused by a prime minister named Wang Anshur, 1021 to 1086. Uh, he was responsible for such uh, policies as a government intervention in the economy, the control of trade, government loans to farmers, and so on. Ideas that sound somewhat like our liberal democratic policies in recent history. There's a lot of argument about Wang Anshur and which side one is on and so forth. But he ran up against an entrenched bureaucracy. Uh, Wang's reforms were nullified by a conservative backlash with which the emperor was eventually sympathetic. Um, 
the famous poet statesman Su Dung Po, who was very central to the new kind of scholar amateur painting, belonged to that side, the conservative side. So this great school of scholar amateur painting, which came to dominate the painting world, arose within a kind of, well, we would call it neocon political situation. That's only a loose parallel, of course, but, and I shouldn't push it too far, but there's some truth in it. Okay, another big important uh, feature in the song, uh, in the early song, is urbanization, the expansion of cities into the greatest on earth, Kaifeng, eventually Hangzhou in the south. This has to do clearly with the growth of landscape painting, that is, they're interrelated. As the great 11th century landscapist Guo Xi was to write, landscape was painted so that people who were kept in the cities by their jobs and their family responsibilities and so on can roam in imagination through the mountains. This is, of course, much like the idea that was behind the essay by Chung Bing that I discussed in the third lecture, Six Dynasties writer who talked about re-experiencing the, the travels of his youth by painting them on his walls. Um, so we were, we're still doing what I call the primary concept of artistic expression in China, in which the scene or the uh, picture of the scene or object uh, substitutes, so to speak, for the real thing, and the viewer responds as he would to the real scene. Also in this period, and very important to this period, is the growth of what is called Neo-Confucianism. That's a foreign term, I think. I don't know what the, there's no easy Chinese equivalent. Maybe it's no longer used. Maybe it's even taboo today. I don't know. I'm talking in 1950s terms in here so much else in these lectures. At any rate, uh, what we used to call Neo-Confucianism, and then there was a whole series of conferences and volumes and so on, great uh, uh, phenomena in Chinese studies. Mm, Arthur Wright, uh, John Fairbank, whole wonder, Fritz Moat, great people. Anyway, this was a broadening, deepening of Confucian, the Confucian tradition, and with some elements taken into it from Taoism and Buddhism, uh, that happened in this period, 10th, 11th century, is a great 11th century. Uh, cosmology, nature seen as operating according to a vast order or a pattern, which is called Li, natural order, something like that. The basic stuff of the world was Qi, or anyway, matter which coagulates into matter. Qi is like vaporous, gaseous. Coagulates into matter and dissolves, moves. According to Li, all this is somehow regulated by this natural order. Now all this makes up a process called Zhao Hua, creation. Creation but also change. And the two go together. Creation equals change. And it's important to thinking about landscape painting. In the ideal situation, the painter creates as nature does, without a conscious purpose. And if he does this, if he's able to do this, his works all have the look of creations of nature, natural by definition, not man-made. And this is the hardest thing in painting to do. And uh, it's only the great artists who are really able to do it consistently. Now how this was accomplished by the great masters of the Northern Sun, we'll see in the next lecture. There's a metaphysical dimension to Neo-Confucianism I don't want to do more than mention that, but it's the question of mind, the nature of knowledge and how it's acquired, the relationship between the knower and the thing known. Buddhism, especially Chan or Zen Buddhism, continues strong in this period, and its influence on art is chiefly, however, in the Southern Sung period. And I'll talk about it then, about Chan or Zen Buddhism. Poetry, calligraphy, ceramics all rise to greatness again. Uh, printing is important. There are more books available than before. This has a great effect on education, obviously, and literacy, and so on, and on this uh, uh, ideal of the educated person, ideal man. Uh, more and more emphasis on collecting, connoisseurship, antiquarianism, that also is all tied in. So there's a whole cluster of uh, events and circumstances that affect very, painting very much, which I'll talk about as we go on. First slide. Um, a landscape by an artist named Yen Wen Gui. He is the first of the great northern Sung landscapists whom I'm going to talk about. Yen Wen Gui was born in the south in Zhejiang province, but was active in the north. He served in the court academy in the capital, Kaifeng, for a time. Had the position of Zhe Ho, kind of painter-in-waiting anyway. And here we see uh, a landscape 
which actually has a signature of Yen Lun Gui on it. If I remember right, it has his title also. People all, all sometimes signed with their uh, name preceded by their title. And uh, this painting actually came to Washington at the time of the Chinese Art Treasures Exhibition. We studied it, but it was not in good enough condition to be exhibited, so we didn't put it in the show. But um, it's, uh, I, it, we, we found the signature, and I was completely convinced that it's a genuine painting by Yen Wen Gui. In my opinion, it's the first painting we've seen that has a reliable signature that allows a firm attribution to a particular artist. So it's all the more remarkable that the painting has been pretty much ignored by most Chinese art historians. This is strange. Lur publishes it, and uh, Seren does, I think. But it hasn't been much, hasn't been much noticed, and it's not in the main books that we use. Anyway, okay. Um, now here is the uh, two two slides of the whole painting. Um, uh, here, you can see the one, one a color slide, uh, much lightened, of course. Actually, the painting is actually very dark. And the other, a black and white slide. Now you can see a landscape type that we already uh, have seen examples of, but uh, examples attributed to earlier artists, which I think are probably really Northern Song. At any rate, it's a type that is originated about now by great masters, such as Yen Wen Gui, and another we'll see named Fan Quan. Well, it's built up, as you see, from landscape forms um, <clears throat> into a, uh, a uh, top, uh, imp very impressive composition dominated by a central peak. This is typical of northern Sung uh, hanging scroll landscapes. Um, and <clears throat> okay, um, now what is new about this picture then? Um, but there's a menu among the paintings we've seen that are reliably of their time. Well, <clears throat> for one thing, there's a great reduction in variety. Uh, the forms, there's much more repetition of forms and uh, a kind of consistency of brushwork throughout the picture, which unifies the whole picture. Uh, there is an effect of light and shadow throughout the painting, but no consistent light source. This is generally true of Chinese painting. Um, shading, as we'll see better in the details. Shading not by shaded graded wash so much as by the application of tsun, texture strokes. This is a translation that I think Alex Soper uh, devised for the Chinese word tsun, which means something like wrinkles. At any rate, uh, texture strokes applied from the contours inward. Um, well, we'll see that in details. The contour drawing itself, again we'll see in details, is of fluctuating bread, thickening and thinning, but rather heavy as it has to be to make it strong enough to hold up in a hanging scroll, which you have to be meant to see mainly from a distance. Uh, lots of buildings and figures in it, as we'll see again, but completely subordinated to the whole. They don't stand out as they do, for instance, in the Emperor Ming Huang's journey to Shu. It's not a picture that has a lot of entertaining detail, which you look at little by little. Um, there are a few touches of light color in it, but mostly it's ink monochrome. Now all of these will be standard features of the great Northern Song monumental landscape, as we'll see. Uh, and they belong to presumably within the, uh, this uh, individual achievement of Yen Wen Gui and also Fan Quan, the next artist we'll see. The two of them are more or less contemporary. I'm treating them as though Yen Wen Gui were a bit earlier and Typologically, I think his painting seems a bit earlier than Fan Quan's, but they're more or less contemporary, as I say. Um, some of these features are probably anticipated in landscapes by the masters of the five dynasties, including some that we don't have. Okay, now let's go on to look at details, coming up closer. Um, the figures in the painting are very small, first of all, but they're important. Uh, one has to be able to find one's way upward. That is, uh, the artist shows you how you climb paths and make your way up to the temples, which are in the valleys in the middle ground. Uh, and then the main peak towers up above that. This is a pattern that we observed already in a landscape attributed to Guantung back in the Five Dynasties. Uh, sort of secular, worldly uh, things down at the bottom, then make your way up along a path to a temple and then the main peak towering above that. And it seems to be fairly standard for 
uh, northern Shug landscape, as we'll see. Um, okay, the whole, um, the figures, the small scale of the figures and of the buildings gives the whole picture a certain a sense of grandeur. Uh, we saw this already, as I say, in the landscape attributed to Guangdong, but more accentuated here. And you see the, the um, landscape masses here uh, are shown with their tops tilted up toward us. Something a bit unnatural, perhaps, but what it does is allow us to read the depth of these forms. We can read the, uh, we can go back across these slanting tops from the front to the back. And also along the sides, which are shown with more or less parallel lines or, or uh, like a, 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 well, folds, you might say. Now this form is repeated by Yen Wenguei roughly, not, not precisely, obviously, it'd be too unnatural, but roughly repeated uh, to, throughout the composition to make up the whole composition up to the main uh, form at the top. Uh, this is a very effective way of giving volume to the landscape forms. Now, let's see, starting out at the bottom here, here's a detail slide of the bottom. Um, the architecture, the, the houses, villas, uh, built by the water here, uh, drawn straight line, neatly. Um, not dull mechanical drawing, but not really very lively either. They're subordinated to the whole, and they're supposed to be. They, they f fulfill their function within the composition, but we're, they're not particularly interesting. We're not drawn to them, so to speak. Then next, please, Mo moving upward. Now here's a closer into the painting of the buildings. The trees are done, as you see, with uh, real repeated um, foliage designs and repeated dotting for other kinds of trees. Not, however, with a real any, any uh, sort of dull sense of repetitiveness as imitations are. We'll see imitations. Um, still fairly lively. And you see here the heavy contours and the texture strokes. Now we saw texture strokes already in a painting attributed to maybe by uh, uh, Dongyuan in the Five Dynasties. Those were called hemp fiber texture strokes, long and stringy. These are of the type called raindrop strokes, raindrop sun. And uh, Fan Quan also uses them. They're little sort of dots instead of long strings. Okay, next please. We see a traveler and his servants and a donkey loaded and so on, making their way across the path. Um, <clears throat> these uh, figures, well, they allow you to move to move through the landscape and imagination and make the climb along with the figures. The, uh, the outline drawing, as you see it clearly here, uh, thickens and thins and is relatively heavy. But it has to be, as I say, to fulfill its function in a painting like this. Okay, next, please. Now, up in the middle, we see the, the temple buildings uh, in the, the mountain valleys and uh, with the paths, uh, one road built out from the cliff here on the left, uh, making their way up to them so that one has a sense of being able to climb up to the temple. So it's that theme again, as we find in northern Shug landscape generally. Next, please. Now here, um, oh here's the, oh there's quite, quite a bit of mold on this picture. It needed to be remounted, uh, which is why, as I say, we didn't, weren't a, not able to put it in the exhibition. Uh, and you can see the mold here, alas. Anyway, the, um, here you can see the texture strokes and the waterfall dropping down uh, from the, uh, along the main mass. Okay, um, the sense of mystery that's important here, nature seen as awesome. Not a pleasure park as it was in the John Suchen painting and others of the Tang Dynasty and around there. This is a great difference. This old part-by-part -part reading of the landscape and the enjoyment of uh, things in it gives way to a new comprehensive view, uh, which is much more ambitious and difficult to achieve. It implies or necessitates a total integration uh, in the work of art as an expression of a unified comprehensive view of nature. This is the great achievement, I think, of northern Chung landscape and sets it apart from anything earlier, anything actually elsewhere in world art, I think. Okay, anyway, so much for that for the time being. I'll come back. Now let me show again, bring back, a painting that we saw in the last lecture attributed to Jing Hao. And when you look at it now, you see that it actually is a painting very much 
uh, in the manner of the northern Sung, with repeated forms with upward slanting tops and and uh, parallel lines, uh, receding sides, um, done much more in a much more mannered way here. Uh, not so not so natural. And as you remember, if we get into the details, they're really not all that great. They don't reveal the hand of a major artist at all. Uh, somebody with uh, a grand conception, maybe, but not not so much of of a, of a, a, a ability in in fine drawing. Okay. Uh, again, the composition is much the same, a secular building down at the bottom, path leading up, temple in the valley, in this case in the middle left, and the great peak towering above that. Okay, so what we have here is a pretty good uh, northern Song landscape, I think, attributed to Jing Hao, which is why I did not take it seriously as his work. And the same way, <clears throat> although much better painting, with this painting attributed to Zhu Ron, which we saw in the last lecture. Again, I think it's a fine painting, I suspect, although I'm not really sure, that it may be Northern Sung, because it has this kind of mm, repetition of forms and uh, slanting tops and the rest of it. Okay, I may be wrong, but uh, I'm inclined to put this maybe in Northern Sung. Think of it as a very fine Juron painting, maybe not complete, as I said when we talked about it, maybe part of a larger composition, maybe from the, 10th, from the 11th century or so. At any rate, okay, whatever. Now, um, uh, now we go on to another painting attributed to Yen Wen Gui. This is a hand scroll, this time, in the former Abe collection in the Osaka Municipal Museum. I've mentioned before that quite a few really important early paintings came into Japanese collections in the early 20th century. Uh, people at that time very rich, were richer than generally many of the collectors in China, were um, uh, uh, buying whatever they could from Chinese collections uh, to supplement and fill out what they saw as, uh, you know, the Japanese tradition of collecting had been fine within certain limits, but there are certain things that didn't have. They didn't have northern Sioux landscapes. They didn't have orthodox school painting or and all kinds of things. Doing around. Okay, enough of that. But anyway, this is a painting that came into Japan at that time, and it's a very fine painting. It's a hand scroll. This is the first half or so of it. We'll see the second half in a minute. It's painted on paper. First thing we've seen of a major landscape on paper. One of the few first paintings we've seen on paper at all, that is. And uh, attributed, it was actually with a signature again at the end of, um, of uh, Yen Wen Gui. Well, um, as you see immediately, it's uh, different in one way, and that is there's a lot of atmosphere in it, blowing winds, trees blowing. This is the beginning, and you see uh, trees on the shore of a river, and uh, it's obviously a kind of windstorm going on. Quite beautiful. Now, I'll show close-up slides in, this, in the second section as we go on. You can see better. Now, here is what follows. As you come, as you come into the second half of the scroll, the landscape forms uh, enlarge and fill the whole composition to the top in one case, one of the peaks going out the top. Uh, the forms are much like the ones in the Yen Wen Gui hanging scroll, that is with the upward tilted slanting tops and so on. Um, whether it is really a genuine Yen Wen Gui painting or a very fine well, schoolwork of a slightly later period is a question. Up here in the upper left corner, you can't really see it or read it obviously, but there is a Yen Wen Gui signature with his with a uh, with his title, so it's to be taken very seriously, and it's one of the really marvelous works of of the period or slightly later. But as we come in closer, we may find that the uh, degree to which it is different from the Yen Wen Gui or from other Northern Song paintings uh, is, is quite significant. Now, <clears throat> first of all, a hand scroll has to be drawn in lighter. Uh, line. You can't have the really heavy contours of a hanging scroll because it's seen up close, the hand scroll that is, whereas the hanging scroll is meant mainly to be seen from uh, further away. Uh, so that's natural enough. But also this uh, quality of, of uh, atmosphere and uh, it's much more pictorial in a way. That is uh, like a picture that you see and respond to yeah, uh, be, uh, in, a, in a way that has to do with the what's happening in the picture. Okay, now going in still closer, you see here, yeah, here we go in. Um, 
the contours are not quite so continuous. The um, uh, texture strokes obviously are not so heavy. As I say, they shouldn't be for a hand scroll. They cannot be. But more importantly is this quite wonderful sense of wind and so forth. There are travelers down here in the lower left making their way across a, uh, a bridge. Much more finely drawn than in the hanging scroll, but that again is natural. The difference between hanging scroll and hand scroll. And then in the upper right, a, some kind of an inn, presumably, where people stop and then travel onward. Okay, I would assume that the painting may be, I published it in my index of early Chinese painters and paintings as probably a work of maybe a century later, maybe uh, maybe 11th century more than 10th, I mean, excuse me, maybe 12th century more than 11th, or later in the 11th century, I don't know, but um, I think it may be just a bit later and possibly a schoolwork, but it's extremely fine, and it's the other uh, important painting that we have from by, uh, or attributed to Yan Wan Gui and with his signature. Uh, for other paintings associated with Yan Wan Gui, you can see Wan Fong's book, Summer Mountains, which he published when he acquired a, a hand scroll in that manner. Um, who painted that? So another question. Okay. But at any rate, a fine book uh, with lots of beautiful uh, plates of early, of early landscapes. If I remember right, however, he downplays the Yen Wan Gui painting that I most emphasize, the hanging scroll. He passes it off as a later imitation or something. There's, there's a little agreement, even among authorities, as you're finding out by now, uh, on the uh, attributions and dating and so on of these early landscapes. Okay, now we go on to the other uh, great, greater really, early northern Song landscape is Fan Quan, who was likewise active from the late 10th into the early 11th century. And we'll look at the the great painting by him, a signed work in the National Palace Museum titled Traveling Among Streams and Mountains. That's the painting is now on the screen. Um, okay, here it is in the whole composition. Well, <clears throat> Fan Quan was the next really great master of landscape after Li Cheng. He has the distinction of having painted one of the two finest surviving Chinese landscapes, the one we have now on the screen. I'll talk about it in a moment. The other was a painting by Guo Shi, which we'll see later. Fan Quan was a northerner born in Shanxi province in the northwest. Um, he was born in the mid-10th century, died sometime after 1026. He was known for his stern character, an uncompromising temperament. The story goes that he began by imitating Li Cheng, following uh, his older master, that is. But then he said to himself, didn't Li Cheng learn directly from the things, the things in nature, that is, question mark? I will take the things themselves as my teacher, teachers. But a still better teacher is my heart, or my mind. In China, heart equals mind. Xin, okay. Then anyway, uh, Fan Quan went to live in the depths of the mountains, we read, and studied the clouds and the mists and the changing effects of sun and wind, the darkening and clearing skies, and so on. And he absorbed these into his mind and set them forth, that is, his understanding of them, in his brush. And, quote, one of them writes, somebody writes, and such were his cliffs and gorges, that they instantly make one feel as if walking along a path in the shade of the mountains. And however great the heat, one shivered with cold and wished for a covering. Therefore, it was commonly said that Fan Quan was able to transmit the spirit of the mountains." End quote. Well, this is essentially the same concept of artistic expression that we saw already in the essay by Tsung Bing, way back in the Sixth Dynasties period. That is a concept in which the painting substitutes for the real scene in evoking the same kind of feelings that the real scene would evoke. Um, it's much uh, elaborated and updated now so as to reflect the greater achievements that are now possible in landscape painting. Well, the painting before us fulfills completely the expectations that are built up by these writings. It's nearly seven feet tall, painted in ink only on silk, and as you can see already, it is a tripartite composition again uh, in, in uh, both ways. That is, uh, you, could, you could say the foreground with the secular figures, we'll see them in a bit, <clears throat> and then, then the middle ground, this uh, rising knoll or whatever bluff with a temple on top and trees, 
and then the great peak rising above that. But uh, it's, it's not the same uh, simple one, two, three as we've seen, but okay. But I'll talk about that. Then in the other way, the main mass in the center and then separated from two lesser masses at the right and left by a waterfall and by a ravine. Okay, so it has that symmetrical uh, tripart, uh, tripart composition. Um, now, whether, whether the painting is later than the N1 Gui painting, it's not clear. They were, as I say, more or less contemporary. Whether that's true or not, it represents a huge leap upward, so to speak. A sudden jump from the small foreground, middle ground forms, this massive bluff. Um, the distance is less at stake here than height and bulk. Um, again, this uh, device is used of having a top of the main landscape form that slants toward us. This is unnatural. If it's as tall as that, we're going to be gazing up at it. We can't see the top. But it, the, the, the technique or the uh, convention works nonetheless, and it allows us to see this form as having a great bulk, a great depth, and then the receding sides again as before. So this is still the same form it works. Well, um, understandably, the painting became very famous and was much copied and one sees numerous copies of it. One of them went to the exhibition in London, 1935 to 36, so I'll talk about that. Okay, now let's go on and look at the details of this painting. Here in the foreground. Down here in the lower right, you see a mule train, uh, two men leading a pack of uh, packed, laden, pack laden mules on a, um, uh, going through the landscape. This is common again. We've seen them, or something like them before. Very secular, very uh, worldly, um, and uh, representing that, that level of existence or of spiritual whatever. Now, uh, you can't see it here, but just more or less above them, <clears throat> in the, uh, right below the, uh, one, one, of the, one of the trees there, the leafy trees, is a signature. I, as I say, I, I can't really show it to you, but the signature was discovered, by the way, by our friend Li Lin San and uh, uh, makes this one of the early, another of the early uh, signed landscapes. It seems to be genuine, uh, written very, very simple. It's only later that painters begin to inscribe, you know, big long inscriptions on their paintings, uh, boastful and telling what they were doing and what they were thinking at the time and all that. A very modest inscription. Okay, then, then the uh, ravine here the uh, water pouring down, the stream pouring down into the foreground, a bridge across it, and um, then you can't really see him, but there is a, uh, up here in the, uh, oh, not, well, not really visible, there's a, a Buddhist monk making his way uh, into the picture uh, in the sort of up, upper left here, but anyway, not, not easily visible, and about to make his way over the bridge and, and up to the temple, which here you can see in the upper right, just the, the um, uh, roofs of the monastery or temple uh, seen over the trees. Uh, well, the, the basic means is much the same. That is, fairly heavy outlines, it has to be, and then texture strokes, again the so-called uh, hemp fiber, no, excuse me, uh, raindrop texture strokes, like little dots, uh, giving texture, rocky texture to the forms, and a certain amount of light and shadow, effects of light and shadow, on these rocks at the left, for instance. I wrote a paper called uh, Some Rocks in Early Chinese Painting, which I analyzed how artists from early times on through Li, through Fan Quan and so on, down to an artist named Li Tong, we'll see later, uh, uh, represented rock, gradually being able to represent both the surface texture and the volume of them. Okay, that's another matter. Okay, anyway, here are the middle ground. Now we go on. Here, closer up, yes. Here's the pa passage with the water pouring down. It all seems, uh, even when you get up close like this, there's nothing that is really uh, unnatural, labored, artificial, uh, simply repeated, as there is in the imitations. It's all, it all has this naturalness of, um, well, the Chinese would say, like a, like a creation of nature. Now, uh, how this was done is, is mysterious, but I'll, I'll talk later about the, what the Chinese think was the way it was done. Uh, notice the foliage of the tree here. It isn't, uh, it's repeated leaves, yes, but not simply repeated and 
uh, bang, 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 uh, copy uh, one, one after another in, in a dull way. Okay, then, uh, now then, further up, uh, move, moving up this picture, here is the, here is the um, temple or monastery roof seen over the middle ground rise. Um, and look at the, the, the foliage here. Oak trees and maybe pine trees up above and so forth, leafy trees. Um, this mass of foliage is really quite remarkable because it could be done, as I say, in simple repetitions. It would be dull and have no visual excitement. And yet he keeps up the visual excitement somehow by never quite slipping into simple repetitiveness and keeping it lively and varying the shapes and the direction of the leaves and making the uh, trunks and branches just, just shine out, stand out through them. Well, okay, we have to see imitations, how it's badly done in order to understand how this is magnificently done. Uh, something you don't appreciate until you see the, until you see the alternatives, so to speak. Well, I'll talk about that too. Now, onward, uh, look, going above this is the um, waterfall uh, and the contours of the rocks again are done in a very quite natural and uh, unmannered way that makes makes the whole thing have this extraordinary sense of of some of a sense of reality, which is what northern Song painting in many ways was really was really after. Um, uh, as I say, the picture looking back at the at the whole, uh, the picture still has this. Part pattern of rising from the secular to the religious to pure landscape. This is obviously the center of the pure landscape part. And um, both the middle ground earth mass and the huge bluff have this slanting top convention that Yen Wen Gui also has. But in the Yen Wen Gui painting, these increase as one rises upward, sort of one, two, three, four. Whereas in Fan Quan's painting, it's more like one, two, fifty. Bang! Sudden, breathtaking ascent as this huge wonderful uh, uh, cliff or whatever it is. Okay, a critic of the time writes about Fan Quan, quote, his were true rocks <clears throat> and all trees rose right up under his brush. If one seeks his qi yun or spirit consonants, it goes beyond mere appearances. He did not rely on adornments. That is, there was nothing pretty in his pictures. And he took no guidance from older masters, but formed his own ideas, working like creation in nature. Therefore, he should be ranked in the divine class. Well, this is an important concept. The painter creates as nature does, without purpose or volition. I'll talk a bit more about that in just a minute. Uh, here, the last slide now on the uh, edge, uh, the left uh, contours of the mountain and the one and the uh, mountain form behind it and beyond, beyond that. Uh, some mm, atmospheric perspective again, darker to lighter to lighter. Here you see the uh, zone of the texture strokes, and you see the outlines. The, outline, <clears throat> the outlines have a certain <clears throat> kind of jerky character, which must have had some, some, uh, uh, some corresponding form in nature. He didn't simply make them up, in other words. Something in the weathered uh, rock and weathered uh, geology of this uh, area where he painted must have given a basis for this kind of of outline, <clears throat> we'll see it turned into a mannerism in the hands of the uh, of the uh, Im of the uh, of the uh, imitators. Well, the point is there's uh, there's nothing artificial and unnatural in all this. Now, Gombrich's idea, which I come back to, that is the artist taking the conventions that he inherits and adjusting them or correcting them in accordance with his observation of natural forms, seems to be perfectly well exemplified here. I think really Gombrich bashers, and they're watching them now, should be sentenced to spend long hours gazing at paintings like this one. Uh, their argument that the forms of the painting, since they are all conventions anyway, are all equally true to nature, is pure nonsense. It's a dumb idea, and I think we should really drop it, and we can't really understand Chinese painting unless we do. Now, the Chinese account for this effect, when it works ideally as it does here, by likening artistic creation to creation in nature. Zhao Hua, they call it. Uh, creation in nature happens without planning or purpose. Nature doesn't have any purpose. 
So everything in nature looks, by definition, natural. Um, whereas the creation of a person, an artist, a human being, cannot ordinarily escape looking man-made. Uh, only if the artist can somehow attain the state of mind that eliminates pur purposefulness will he create as nature does and transcend artifice and achieve this rare effect of naturalness or rightness. This is a profound idea, I think, which we shouldn't pass off too quickly as incompatible with our own thinking about art. One of the, it's a basic to the great achievement, I think, of Northern Sun Landscape. Okay, now, let's go on. Here's another painting ascribed to Fan Quan. This is the one titled Sitting Alone by the Stream, also in the National Palace Museum, reproduced by Siren and uh, the Possessing the Past book. Uh, this was in the 1996 Possessing the Past exhibition at the Metropolitan Museum from the from the Palace Museum in Taipei. It replaced the real Fan Quan <clears throat> when that, <clears throat> that and other great masterworks had to be withdrawn. Originally, the selection is done by one Fong and people at the Palace Museum had included these great masterworks, but there was a, a real protest in Taiwan from people who complained that here the foreigners were getting to see all these great early paintings, whereas they weren't very often shown to us or not exhibited all that much at the Palace Museum. So there was so much political protest that some of the great paintings had to be withdrawn and replaced. And this is the Fan Quan that came. Excuse me. Well, it is, a, it is a, an impressive painting. At the time, way back, before we were able to see these paintings in the originals and make great slides and so on, uh, this painting was uh, seen as equally important to the Fan Quan by some. I remember Max Lohr saying that this is in some ways a more impressive painting, really, a more dramatic painting, certainly, than the real Fan Quan. But when you come in to look at details of it, you realize that this is very definitely a schoolwork and very definitely inferior. Uh, to the Fan Quan. Now let's put it off the side and look at the series of details next to it. Now here a detail from the foreground. Now okay, the buildings are drawn all right in this uh, sort of heavy parallel line manner that uh, is okay for Northern Chung landscape. But look at the trees. This is what I this is what, <laughs> what I pointed out Fan Quan did not do. Uh, Fan Quan is vastly superior to this. This is an artist who starts with a pattern and continues the pattern until he has filled his space repetitively. Uh, you cannot really read the structure of the trees or the uh, different kinds of foliage or anything. It's, it's, it's largely space filling. While this detail is on the screen, let me point out another important difference between this and the real Fan Quan. Under the trees in the lower left, we see two people, maybe a man and his servant, sitting on the edge of the water. And the man is gazing out over the water. Uh, this is the source of the title. He is the one sitting alone by the stream. And what he is doing is gazing at the landscape, admiring it. Later in this lecture and in the next, I'll develop the idea that representations featuring somebody looking out over the landscape or enjoying the landscape uh, belong later. None of the figures in the Yen Wan Gui painting or the real Fan Quan or in a scroll probably by an artist named Xu Dao Ning that we'll see in a bit None of the people in those is going to stop and look at the scenery. And that in itself indicates here, I think, a later date for the picture. I simply call attention to this detail now, and I'll develop this observation as we go on in relation to other paintings. Now, next slide. Here, going up and seeing some of the rocks. Uh, the light and shadow is dramatic, uh, more dramatic than the real Fan Quan. But um, it's a drama achieved, I say, at the expense of any effect of real naturalism or truth to nature and so on. And here again, the trees have the uh, oh, strong contrasts, light against dark and so on. And uh, look at the patterning of the bare tree in the upper right here. Uh, that's uh, simple. Let's say you learn a pattern and you repeat it until you're finished. Well, it's an impressive painting, but in a much shallower way. Next, please. Here, further up. Um, now you see the contours. Uh, we saw just a bit ago the real contours of the Fan Quan painting. Now you can imagine how a, a uh, school artist, an artist who learns the Fan Quan manner, um, learns how to do that, but then turns it into something. Look here in the uh, middle upper, uh, a, little, a whole series of little arcs 
the, 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 the artist moving the brush, that is, in a series of arcs to make a series of pointed, for, a little uh, a line with a series of little pointed things sticking out, and also on the uh, form to the right here. The, this massive rocky form seen on the right ends below, as you see, in a kind of uh, uh, just uh, trails off into a, uh, a, a, a earth, an earthy bank, which is a kind of weak ending for something like that. And then here's the peak. Well, this, as I say, it's impressive. Sudden light and dark sh shading and differences. Uh, and uh, the, the artist learns all the conventions, such as the slanted top and this kind of stubby foliage or uh, whatever uh, that uh, covers the tops of Fan Quan Mountains. But look at the contour again on the, on the left here, upper left. Uh, the brush swings and simple... Uh, things and then comes out to a point and then makes another swing and another point and so on. Okay, not terrible, but not not really that impressive once you get into it. It doesn't satisfy in the world in the way the great Fun Quan does. Okay, next, uh, many copies of the painting were done. This is one of them in the 17th century by artists of the Orthodox school, such as Wang Hui. Uh, this may be Wang Hui. I don't remember exactly, but. Paintings like this used to be shown in the Palace Museum as though they were really Fan Quan, or they would be there instead of the Fan Quan when they didn't want to show the original. And um, one of these, as I remember, I'm not clear, I don't have the book here. I think one of them went to the 1935-36 uh, exhibition, but apart from that. But you, you can see what is lost here. This is a 17th century rendering, and all the grandeur of the original uh, is lost. The scale is different. Everything is different. Okay, skip that. Now we go on. There are many fine works of the Fan Quan school around. Um, really works of some importance. I'm not. I don't want to put them down and say they're, you know, without value simply because they develop mannerisms that uh, distinguish them clearly from the great Fan Quan painting. This is one also in the in the uh, National Palace Museum. A snow landscape or a winter landscape anyway. And you see that this receding top, the convention of the receding top with all the stubby uh, foliage or vegetation uh, going back along the top, which you read upward, uh, has been exaggerated. It generally is elongated in the, in the, uh, uh, in the imitations or the school works. And uh, as before, we have secular figures and travelers and so on down below, and we have a temple in the valley, in this case in the left, uh, middle left here, and so forth, and a recession on the right. Well, uh, the conventions, but, but very different. But it's been a strong painting and interesting and worth having. I don't want to put them down too much. I'm only saying that uh, the qualities of the Fan Quan have been largely lost to the schoolworks, fine as they may be. Uh, here's another one. Uh, next, please. This one, I think, is former Crawford collection now in the Met. And again, you can see some of the conventions of Fan Quan. I think this is a Fan Quan attributed picture, yes. And uh, bare trees down below. But this is the kind of composition that is asymmetrical, uh, recession along one side, a path going back there, and uh, the rise of mountain forms on the other side. But more elaborate, more uh, broken up, not this uh, grand unity of the Fan Quan. Next. Now this painting is interesting. This is <clears throat> this is a Fan Quan attributed painting in the Tianjin Museum in China, and it actually has a Fan Quan signature somewhere down among the trees. There's some problem with that signature. It gives him a title he didn't have, or something like that. I don't remember that clearly. But at any rate, it uh, when when it was sort of discovered and first published and reproduced, published and exhibited, uh, the Chinese on the mainland were you know, exultant. They, here was their Fan Quan to match the great one they had lost. Generally, uh, I'll talk about this at some point along the way, the great hanging scrolls in the imperial collection went to Taiwan. They were all packed up and, uh, and shipped off to Taiwan and they were there now, hanging scrolls. Some of the hand scrolls, smaller pictures and albums on the other hand, were taken out of the palace by the last emperor, Pui, and his uh, brother, and taken to mm, Tianjin and eventually up, up to the northeast at any rate, and were scattered and stayed on the mainland. So the mainland has many 
early paintings in hand scroll form. Some of them went to Japan, like the Abe picture. Um, and uh, <clears throat> on the other hand, the, the, the mainland people are lacking in great hanging scroll compositions. Okay, when they found this one then with a Fan Quan signature, they were, as I say, very happy. They published it as though it were the real thing. Okay, I, uh, I can tell an interesting um, story about this. Um, a former student of mine named Jane Debevoise, very good student. Now, she lived a long time in Hong Kong, now back in New York. Jane was in the gallery at the Tianjin Museum where this was hanging. And I guess she was maybe talking to somebody about it or whatever. And was challenged by a Chinese there who asked her why this is not the real Fan Quan. Why do you foreigners not accept this as the real Fan Quan, like the one in Taiwan and so on? Well, Jane was for the moment nonplussed uh, because in order to <laughs> explain why you need to show the real Fan Quan. In other words, we do it with comparative slides and there, there it's pretty clear. But it's not so easy standing in front of an old looking painting with a signature on it and telling somebody why this doesn't work and this doesn't work. Jane at any rate uh, looked around and spotted a tourist somewhere across the gallery or somewhere else with a copy of my old Scara book in which the Fan Quan painting was reproduced and she rushed across and grabbed it out of that person's hands. I mean, I'm making this up somewhat, but this is her story. And came back and was able to open it and show the real Fan Quan and make, give her a lecture on why one was and one wasn't a great uh, early Northern Song painting. Anyway, okay, it's, it's not a bad painting. It's just a, just a schoolwork. And again, the, uh, the uh, recession along the slanting top is strung out and elaborated and... Uh, becomes much more broken up. The whole picture is, in fact. And the temple and the, the bare trees down below and some secular houses off here in the lower left. Well, it's, it's a fine uh, schoolwork, but not, not, uh, not like Fan Quan, not remotely like Fan Quan. All kind of broken up and a bit fussy compared to the Fan Quan. Note, by the way, that here the, uh, these vertical lines show that it was made or painted on three... Uh, three widths of silk. You can see the joins. Well, I can't talk too much about that. Uh, Bob Mowry of the Fog Museum has, has been working on silk in early paintings. He could speak. But I think that may be a count against it. I'm not sure. Anyway, leave that aside. Okay, here we go. Now, here, oh, here's a, this is a lovely little painting, really. This is a fan painting. A uh, painting originally mounted on a flat fan. The shape of it shows that. And it's in the Boston Museum of Fine Arts, and it's attributed to Fan Quan. And in old books, it comes out as Fan Quan. Well, obviously, it isn't. But this is a southern Song painting, maybe 12th, early 13th century, something like that, by some maybe artist of the Southern Song Academy or um, someone outside the Academy in the same style. At any rate, uh, the kind of asymmetrical composition that was popular at that time, everything packed into one side and the other side more or less empty, uh, it's a fine schoolwork of the late Song period, uh, and, um, and worthwhile is that. You see over here in the middle left a traveler arriving through the snow to presumably stop in these buildings in the bamboo grove in the middle, and then over at the right, um, bear trees and the temple and the farm in the middle right, and then <laughs> here's the top of the, the Fan Quan mountaintop with its uh, foliage and so on. Okay, the school style continues and, and is used for original works as well as for imitations. This is one of the original works. Quite fine in its own way. Okay, here we go. Now then, now we come to uh, the next major master in the lineage of Li Chung, um, who is Xu Daoning. Xu Daoning uh, dates her around 1000 to sometime after 1066. In other words, he was active in the early to the mid-11th century. He achieved some renown in his day, although he was never considered one of the greats in the way that Li Chung and Fan Quang were. Still, he's one of the, the paintings that we're seeing here, and bad slides to begin with, is one of the finest northern Song landscapes that we have, and is attributed to Xu Daoning and may very well be by him. I, I'm ready to accept it as quite likely really by him. It's a hand scroll titled Fishing in the Mountain Stream, 
and it's the Nelson Gallery in Kansas City. This is another great Sickman acquisition, Larry Sickman, who had such a marvelous eye for painting and such a lot of great, great opportunities, which he took advantage of. It's a hand scroll, and uh, about 20 inches tall, as I remember. I've come to that. Yeah, about 20 inches tall. And um, painted in ink and very slight color on silk. It is, as I say, an attribution only. There's no signature, but a believable attribution, I think. And is the best example we have of a landscape hand scroll from this period. Well, to begin with, it's tripartite again, balanced, the kind of balanced form, symmetrical form, like the Fan Quan and others. That is, the foreground elements at the beginning and end in the far right and far left corners, uh, close up, two long recessions along river valleys, and then a central mass in the center. And I'll show details of these. Okay, now let's, uh, that's the whole composition, the whole painting. And as I say, that uh, for me, it is believable as a hand scroll equivalent to the great hanging scroll compositions of the Northern Song period. Now let's begin. These slides were made by Mark Wilson for, uh, for many years, the director of the Nelson Gallery, the major pupil of, or uh, protege of uh, Sickman and fine scholar in his own right. Okay, a uh, slide by Mark. I could. Now, here in the, at the beginning, in the right corner here, we see a tango of uh, groups of old trees. We'll see them closer up in a minute. And also down here, uh, you see a, a flag projecting from just barely visible a fence and part of a building. And that's, uh, the, the, the flag means it's an inn or a wine shop, and it means travelers can stop there. And in fact, uh, there is indication throughout the painting of how you can move through it. Uh, as you do, in fact, through some other Northern Song paintings. I mean, they sort of show show the paths and the bridges and so on. Okay, then then we see this uh, magnificent view back into the river valley and then distant peaks. And at the left, uh, more uh, closer up, uh, more trees and so on. There's some buildings at the far uh, left here, a few houses in the landscape, but not very much. Okay, the distance is marvelously handled. Uh, from the tangled, uh, very uh, d detailed trees in the foreground to others further back that are simpler and others further back simpler still, eventually they, in, in middle distance they become sort of uprights with horizontals and then still further back just uh, upright sticks. So, and this is accompanied by a dimming in ink tone for atmospheric perspective. So here we have this wonderful view over the uh, river valley. I remember in Berkeley a student pointed out something I had not realized that what we're looking at here is a glacial valley. That is valley sort of scooped out, rounded out by the uh, by packs of ice coming down and uh, pushing through the through the through the landscape uh, like Yosemite in other words. Well I hadn't realized this but uh, in these landscapes generally uh, they're true to nature in the sense that there is usually going to be some geological truth behind them if you can only find it. Um, well, I'll go on say, uh, let's see, next slide. Yeah, here is the, the um, foreground uh, 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 more close up, the, the lower right, the beginning of the picture. It's a magnificent rendering of old trees. There's no simple schematic patterning again natural in the best sense, in the same sense that the trees in the Fan Quan were. This, as I say, is the hardest thing to do, as the Chinese recognized. Not at all something that any artist can pick up their brush and start doing. Um, and, okay, and then even, even here you see some atmospheric dimming from n uh, near trees to s slightly further trees. But even the further trees are drawn in a really sort of lively, interesting way. Throughout the painting, the hand of the artist is, you know, there. Okay, here's the here's a slide of the central section. At the right, you can see the uh, few few buildings that are uh, in the picture, and then this um, um, this um, massive uh, dead uh, uh, towering um, uh, formation of cliffs uh, extending up past the top of the scroll, actually. Um, there's a path with bridges, uh, you can see in the lower left here, and so on. 
uh, it, uh, this kind of path leads throughout the scroll, allowing the viewer to find his way along the path to make, a, make his way through the scroll. So it's the kind of painting that we're invited to enter and move around in, like, uh, like some of the others we've seen. The diagonal, these sheer formations, uh, geological formations, uh, seem strange. I, I don't know exactly what's behind them, especially these, let's see the detail now, yes, here. Uh, especially the, um, uh, these diagonally projecting jagged forms. But I'm sure there's something geologically true behind them. I don't know what it is. But these people didn't simply make up strange forms. They didn't push nature around. They didn't play games with nature at this time. They were much too serious in their purpose to do that. For the hand scroll, uh, it's not, the artist doesn't use texture strokes exactly, or not, not completely. It's not quite graded wash either, but it's rather broader strokes. Uh, this probably, again, is geologically true. We're not looking at fractured rock, some other, some other kind of geological formation. I can't tell you what it is. But as I say, you can assume that there's some truth, truth in the real world behind it. Uh, now, next then. Um, then, again, we come to the valley, and at the right, the meandering river, and the trees diminishing at a distance. Uh, more peaks in the far distance. Um, well, um, viewing the painting is really a moving experience. Uh, the famous literati critic Mi Fu, later in the century, who was a spokesman for the new attitudes that really put an effective end to this kind of painting, this greatest age of landscape, Mi Fu pronounced Xu Dao Ning to be plebeian. And this painting is not worth looking at. Well, the profound wrongness of much of scholar amateur uh, schools, their self-serving rhetoric, is something we're not just now coming to realize, I think, at least some of us are. This kind of painting was totally beyond their abilities, so they derided it. They said it you know, was, isn't really worth doing. We'll talk about that when we come to talk about the literati painting school in the next lecture. Well, it's like some critics in the 20th century. I remember a French artist in the 1950s, I can't remember his name. He was famous then, but sort of faded away now. Anyway, he announced that he wouldn't walk across the street to see a Renaissance painting. Oh, well, <laughs> you can see who, which side I'm on. There we go. Um, okay, anyway, great, great uh, shoe down name. Now, here's the last section. There's a little bit cut off the bottom. We don't see the whole thing. Somehow the, uh, the slide doesn't take in the entire painting. But you see here the uh, uh, path making its way across the, across the uh, painting and in the middle here, a traveler on a donkey and his servant carrying the luggage. And then beyond that, again, this um, really um, magnificent uh, view into distance and the further peaks, all completely natural, nothing of Nothing of the man-made about it, nothing that is obviously man-made. As in the Zhao Gan scroll and others, we have some figures that are making their way through the painting, sort of upper-class figures who are traveling, and other figures who are part of the landscape, fishermen and, uh, and the, yeah, uh, there are fishermen here too, people who live there versus people who move through. It's a wonderful spaciousness about the whole thing, a sense of clear, cold air. It makes you think of moments you've spent in uh, places like this anyway, depending on your experience. Here up close are the fishermen in boats. This is the part that wasn't shown in the spot I just had, but it's a detail. Uh, well, again, they look uh, enlarged as much as this. The thick line drawing makes it look rather cartoon-like, but it's just right in the context of the large scroll, which, as I said, is about 20 inches tall. So um, also you can see here uh, the ripples in the water, drawn with great sensitivity and with, an, again, total absence of pattern and simple repetition. It's like the foliage and von Quan and so on. This is, the great artist has this ability to draw anything at all and keep it, keep it natural and interesting and visually, uh, visually somehow moving. Um, okay, no simple repetitions. Now here at the end of the scroll, now here you can see pretty much the end. There's a touch of the anecdotal here at the end. The merchant waving his staff, trying to uh, 
trying to uh, drive his stubborn donkey into the boat so he can take it across the river, and his servant and the boatman and so on. Um, okay, this is, um, let's say, um, anecdotal, but it doesn't detract really from the uh, grandeur, the profound seriousness of the whole scroll. A little touches like this. Uh, and up above you see the traveler on his mule and, uh, I guess the mule, or donkey anyway, and, uh, and his servant with the, with the luggage. Okay, wonderful, wonderful painting. Okay, now on to another one. Here, I think we'll see both parts, part one and part two of the whole scroll. This is another painting attributed to Xu Daoning. This one in the Fuji E Yunin Khan in Kyoto. Uh, this is another painting, former imperial collections that came into Japan early in the 20th century. Uh, Barnhart reads this painting, by the way, as evening bell from a distant temple, one of the so-called eight views of the Shaoxiang region. I'll talk, talk about them later. He has a theory that much of Song painting, which we don't has doesn't carry these titles now, originated as part of such a series. Well, I don't. I'm not taking sides one way or the other. I don't quite see it that way, but he could be right. Okay. Um, anyway, uh, in the in the in the middle ground here, uh, where there are tangled trees, uh, we see indeed behind the trees a the roofs of a temple, which could be a, a, a Buddhist temple anyway. Now. Um, this is the other old scroll attributed to Xu Daoning, along with the Knowlson Gallery picture, but in my view at least, a much, much lesser picture. Mark Wilson, who writes a long and fine essay about the Kansas City scroll in the Eight Dynasties catalog, with lots of quotations from early writers and lots of good information, he, unaccountably for me, accepts this as Xu Daoning's work, and he makes it an earlier work of the artist than the Kansas City scroll. I don't think myself it can possibly be by Xu Daoning, and I'll explain why in just a minute. It's profoundly different in its whole conception, and I think belongs to a different age and a different type of landscape. Okay, how is it different? Now, you see the beginning here with the, again, tall trees in the foreground, drawn indeed in a very convincingly Xu Daoning-like way. That much is okay. But then you see here at the far left in the lower corner, next please, the detail. Uh, Two figures, three figures really, uh, two scholars with caps, uh, well, their staffs and so on, and robes, and then the little boy servant who ordinarily accompanies them. And one of them is standing here on the edge of this uh, overhanging ledge, whatever, and turning to the other one and reaching out his arm and pointing, saying, look, look, uh, look at the landscape, or listen to the, temp the Buddhist temple gong, or whatever he's saying. In other words, we have people contemplating the landscape. And um, this, for me at least, um, changes the whole character of it. The landscape uh, itself is, is drawn much more simply. It loses this traversable, complete character, a uh, complete world character. It becomes the object of gaze, simplified. We'll see other paintings that exhibit this new phenomenon, and I'll talk about it more. It changes the whole character of landscape not all for the better. That is, the landscape becomes something that is contemplated, that's to be looked at, not something that you are supposed to enter into and move around in an imagination, not a complete real world, so to speak. And this makes a profound difference. Okay, I'll, con I'll continue that as we go on. We'll see a couple of paintings attributed to Guarchi in the next part of this lecture, which uh, uh, exemplify this phenomenon too. Okay, next please. Well, here's another painting attributed to Xu Daoning, a hanging scroll in this case, also in the Palace Museum, Dense Snow on a Mountain Pass. This is reproduced in Lur's book and elsewhere. Um, and Lur should, should not have published this. It has lots of works in Lur's book that shouldn't be there, really. This is another work by Wang Hui of the uh, mid 17th century. This brilliant uh, Orthodox school artist. Uh, brought up as a protege by or later, older or Orthodox school, Wang Shermin, Wang Zhen. And uh, he can paint in all styles in, in a way, and he can convince people of that time enough so that he does forgeries. And this is a painting by Wang Wei in the manner of Xu Daoning. Well, it not, isn't really. And uh, if we think of how people as good as Lur and 
the Chinese connoisseurs who have shown this and have reproduced it and so on, we realize how well, how recent it's been possible, how only recently has it been possible to develop enough of a sense of what was po what's right for the uh, northern Song to realize this is terribly wrong. Uh, look at the detail now. Once you've looked at it for a while, you look at the upper right here. It looks like somebody's foot sticking up into the sky. Well, once you see that, you can't look at anything else. I don't know. I don't know whether Wang Hui intended this or painted it in by mistake or what. At any rate, it make it uh, completely uh, makes the whole thing impossible. But it's impossible anyway. It isn't Northern Song style even. Uh, it's a, a distorted, uh, strange, and anyway, okay. Um, as I say, Chinese connoisseurship has been very strong for the Yuan and later painting, which they're much better than we are generally. Uh, in other words, uh, from mm, the time uh, this this course will stop, around the late 13th century onward, uh, they're marvelous. C.C. Si Wang Yichan and Xu, uh, Xu Bangda and others, okay. But for the early periods, they are not so terrific um, and make mistakes, whereas we make many, many mistakes for the late period. I'm not I'm not arguing any kind of superiority, obviously. At any rate, so much for the first half of this lecture. Um, the second half will feature the last really major master within the Northern Song monumental landscape tradition, that is Guo Xi. And so we stop here.